this set of material we'll be talking about the digestive system. And with the digestive system there are a number of structures and functions, but really when we think about it, the main points of the digestive system are going to be to ingest food, break down what we need, or break down that food, absorb what we need, and then eliminate what we don't need. So it's really rather um, energy efficient if you think about it that way. When we consider the different parts of a digestive system, we can talk about what's called the digestive tract. This is also known as the gastrointestinal tract. It's also known as the alimentary canal. And basically what that means is that all of these regions here that are included in this red font here are part of the digestive tract. So you start with the mouth and then the throat through the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, and then the rectum and anus. It's really one long continuous tube um, and then other glands that feed into it and other organs that feed into it are called the accessory organs. And these are going to be things like salivary glands, uh, the pancreas, whoops, the liver, the gallbladder as well. And so basically anything that kind of facilitates digestion. When we think about different functions of the digestive system, um, ingestion is basically just putting food into the mouth or putting food into the stomach. So that first slide that we looked at where ingestion is kind of the first topic, um, once that food is ingested, we have to start to break it down. So one way of physical digestion is chewing, which is also called mastication. And then what also has to happen is that that food needs to be propelled to the next area in the digestive tract. And so one example of that would be um, swallowing. And this involves a movement called peristalsis. And what peristalsis is, is sort of a muscular contraction, kind of a contraction and relaxation. And this will move the food through our digestive tract. And so what that means is that we have different types of muscular contractions that take place. Basically a squeezing with circular muscle and then also a sort of pushing with longitudinal muscle. So if you look at this green little dot here, this represents the food moving through something like the esophagus. So in the upper gastrointestinal tract, we primarily have things like ingestion and mastication and propulsion. And then in the lower digestive tract, we're going to have more sort of mixing and different types of secretions. And so in addition to peristalsis, we also have what's called segmentation. And segmentation is really just a mixing. So when we look, for example, at the picture here, um, different parts of, say, the small intestine are going to mix together different areas of that food, and that's going to help to further along digestion. Secretion is going to involve different types of liquids that are released from different cells and different glands that will help to chemically break down our food. And so digestion, like I said, is basically uh, referring to both the mechanical or the physical breakdown. That's going to be something, again, like chewing or mixing. Whereas a chemical breakdown is actually going to break the whoops, chemical bonds within that food. And then that's how we can extract nutrients. Absorption, which is pretty important, primarily happens in our small intestine. And that's actually going to move from the digestive tract into our bloodstream. And then that's important so that we can use that for the rest of our body. And then again, elimination would involve actually eliminating that food um, from the rectum and anus. Anything that we don't absorb will be eliminated. So like I said, it's really rather um, efficient. In terms of regulating this, um, as with most all of our functions in the body, there is a nervous system regulation that takes place. And this is called, this is a part of the nervous system referred to as the enteric nervous system. There's sensory neurons, motor neurons, and then this is going to coordinate the muscular movements. 
One of the examples I can give with this is that, for example, if you're in a restaurant and you've ordered your food and it's taking a while, every time a waiter brings by a plate of food for somebody else, and if you just see that food, sometimes you start to salivate a little bit. What that's doing is that those salivary glands are releasing saliva and basically preparing the body for digestion. So that can also play a role with chemical regulation in that there's different hormones that can help to stimulate and maintain digestion. What we're gonna do next is basically take a walk through our alimentary canal and look at the major players in each of the areas of the digestive system. So first in the oral cavity, there's a couple of things to, to notice here. And in the lab portion, we'll also talk about what these different um, anatomical structures are, but in the mouth itself, otherwise known as the oral cavity, the vestibule is really just the the whole space within there, between the lips and the cheeks, also referred to as the oral cavity proper. We have the hard and soft palate. The hard palate is represented by a bony structure, and the soft palate is, is behind there, a little bit softer. And then the tongue, of course, is a giant skeletal muscle. And it's skeletal muscle because we can voluntarily control its movement. And the tongue is involved in things like speaking and, of course, tasting. It also helps with chewing. If you think about when you chew food, you can kind of mix it and move it around with your tongue. And then it also initiates the swallowing process, which we'll talk about in a few slides. And so really what we see here is that where where food is, foost, food is first introduced into the mouth, there are a number of structures there, including our teeth. Of course, the teeth are going to help with the chewing as well as the tongue. We also have salivary glands, and salivary glands' major job is to produce saliva. And saliva really gets kind of a bad rap. If you think about it, when you spit on someone, you probably don't like them very much, right? When was the last time you spat on someone um, because you were happy with them, right? Hopefully you don't go around doing that anyway, but um, really saliva is quite useful and beneficial to us. What it does is it's actually antimicrobial, so it prevents infection. And one of the examples of this, if you think about um, animals when they lick their wounds, this is actually providing an antimicrobial benefit to the wound itself. Saliva also helps to lubricate the mouth, lubricate the food that we're chewing and make it easier to swallow. And then it contains an enzyme, so salivary amylase is an enzyme, which is going to break down starch. And if you remember, starch is actually a um, long chain of glucose molecules. And in that way, um, we can start that chemical digestion right away. Our body can't digest starch unless it's broken down. So saliva, very important. Um, after the mouth, the food is going to start to get pushed into the pharynx and the esophagus. And another word for the pharynx that you're probably familiar with is the throat. And the pharynx actually has a couple of different regions to it. And I'm going to go back to this picture here on the a couple slides earlier. We have the, the nasopharynx the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. And we'll also highlight these in the lab portion. But the nasopharynx is the region of the throat that is kind of at the back of the nose that comes down to about the uvula. The oropharynx is probably what you're most familiar with in terms of the throat, and that's going to be from the tip of the uvula to the tip of the epiglottis. And then the remainder, the laryngopharynx, is between the tip of the epiglottis and the um, the lower entry into the larynx, and the laryngopharynx is then continuous with the esophagus. So just a review there of where those structures are, but if we think about it, the nasopharynx really doesn't have much to do with the digestive system because it's in the nose. And so unless your uvula quits working and you shoot food or liquids out of your nose if you're laughing or eating or something, um, this is primarily going to be part of the respiratory system rather than the digestive system. However, the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx are going to transmit food and liquids and air normally.
from the lar- excuse me from the laryngopharynx we would move into the esophagus and the esophagus is really just a muscular tube used for transportation from the pharynx into the stomach um, it's going to pass through an opening through the diaphragm. If you think about where the esophagus and the stomach are, it does have to move through the diaphragm. So there's an opening there called the esophageal hiatus. And sometimes, if the if part of the stomach ends up on the other side of the diaphragm through that opening, that's called a hiatal or hiatal hernia. Basically, any time a part of the body ends up sort of pushed through a space that it's not supposed to be, that's a that's a hernia. Because there's movement of food through this muscular tube, and I'll just sort of make a note that this is a muscular tube, we're going to have some peristalsis type movement here. There are different types of sphincters that have to control the movement of that food. And so there's an upper and lower esophageal sphincter that will maintain the movement of that food. And this might make a bit more sense if we take a look at the swallowing slide on the next page. And so another word, the medical term for swallowing is, is deglutition. And it, this slide kind of follows, starts here, and then it's going to follow along the page. And so in the beginning, whatever you've chewed, whatever you are going to swallow, that's called the bolus of food. So the bolus gets chewed up, and then the first phase of swallowing is actually voluntary. And if you think about it, if you have some saliva in your mouth right now, you can do this and kind of see what's happening. But what happens is that the voluntary phase, the bolus of food, is moved to the back of the oral cavity into the pharynx by the tongue. So your tongue kind of pushes up on your hard palate and that pushes that bolus back. At this point, the upper esophageal sphincter is closed. Um, but once that voluntary phase takes place, then the pharyngeal uh, reflex starts, that sphincter is going to open and the bolus of food enters the esophagus. Then that sphincter closes and now the bolus is in the esophagus and it's going to move through peristalsis, peristalsis, excuse me, through the esophageal phase down into the stomach. And this lower esophageal sphincter will open and close um, when needed. And so basically swallowing involves, and if you look at your notes page, three different phases, a voluntary phase of the tongue pushing on the food to the back of the throat, to a pharyngeal phase where it gets pushed into the pharynx, and then finally an esophageal phase. Once the food is in the stomach, then a number of other things are going to occur. And the stomach is quite unique in that it's really just sort of a storage tank uh, for food until it gets broken down. And it takes, depending on what you've eaten and how much, it takes anywhere from four to six hours to empty the stomach. And when the stomach is empty, we can see some folds within there, and those folds are referred to as rugae. And then these folds will flatten out when food starts to enter the stomach. The bladder has a similar type of function where it's when it's not when it's empty, we can see folds and then it can hold so much liquid at one time. We can also see that there's three layers of muscle that surround the stomach, and so that's going to help with the physical mechanical digestion of the ch kind of the churning and mixing that we see. And then within the stomach itself, the, there are cells, tons of epithelial cells that line the inside of the stomach. And they have a pretty important job. There's different types of mucus cells that will produce mucus. Um, and that's because the cells called parietal cells are going to produce hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid has a pH of about 2. And if these other cells didn't produce mucus, basically that hydrochloric acid would eat the stomach away itself. And so it's very important that there's mucus there. Um, if that mucus lining becomes overwhelmed or becomes disturbed somehow, that can result in ulcers because then the stomach lining is exposed to the, to the acid itself. So we have parietal cells that produce hydrochloric acid and then what are called sheaf cells that produce pepsinogen. And I'm going to add a slide here and kind of show you what, what happens with that. And so when we think about these different types of 
cells. So we have parietal cells, can't spell, that will produce hydrochloric acid. We have chief cells that produce pepsinogen. Okay. Now, when we have a protein, proteins get broken down into amino acids. Okay, this is a review from our chemistry unit a long time ago. In order to do this, in order to break down a protein into amino acids, there's another protein or enzyme that's needed called pepsin. Okay, now we don't want to just have pepsin hanging around in our body because it would break down proteins all the time. So the inactive form of, pep of pepsin is called pepsinogen. So this is the inactive form. Now in order to go from pepsinogen into pepsin, this requires our good old friend hydrochloric acid. Okay, so now we can kind of see how all of these things will will group up together. So in order to break down proteins, which the stomach does, it's going to need pepsin. In order to have pepsin, the chief cells have to produce pepsinogen, and to activate pepsinogen, they need hydrochloric acid. So one of the things that happens, I mentioned earlier, with digestive system regulation is that when different hormones are produced and different types of local reflexes are produced, one example of this could be things like releasing hydrochloric acid and releasing pepsinogen. When you feel your stomach kind of gurgling, that's those juices that have started to develop in that way. So you won't be asked for this level of detail on your exam. I just wanted to give you kind of a background of what's happening there. As I mentioned, those secretions are going to get kind of get ready. Every time our body makes those secretions, it's basically to prepare the body for digestion. And so here's some examples of gastric or stomach secretions where just tasting food, smelling food, having food in the mouth, that will say to the brain, hey, we better start stimulating the digestive system, so that's going to produce different types of secretions. Additionally, when the stomach becomes distended, so when food enters the stomach, that also will secrete or stimulate different secretions. And then if different, if there's inhibitory reflexes, um, we can also see that as well. So if there, once the stomach might be emptying, we're going to turn off some of those reflexes. In addition to breaking down proteins, there's also some peristalsis, or again, peristalsis is that muscular sort of waves of contraction. Um, we have to be able to move that liquefied food uh, into the into the end of the stomach as well. Um, this liquefied food is called chyme. Whoops, it always autocorrects that spelling for me. And chyme is really just what is left over after the hydrochloric acid and proteins have been broken down. So your liquefied food is chyme. So this is all chyme and it moves through the stomach through peristalsis. And once it gets to the end of the stomach, there's a, a sphincter there called the pyloric sphincter, which is then going to empty into the duodenum, which is otherwise known as the first section of the small intestine. And there's only about three milliliters, which is not very much liquid, that enter into the small intestine at one time. So that's why it takes about five hours to empty the stomach and why you might be hungry if you haven't eaten in four to five hours, for example. Once that food does move into the small intestine, then we can kind of take a look at that. And again, there are different sections of the small intestine that we'll talk about in lab. Um, the first and shortest section is called the duodenum. And this is where we're still going to see some digestion taking place in addition to maybe starting some absorption. Um, then we also have the jejunum, which is the middle section. And it's kind of hard to see where it starts and stops, but kind of the middle area is the jejunum. And then the last and longest section is called the ileum. And by the time food gets to the ileum, it's pretty much 
all of the nutrients have pretty much been absorbed at that point. And so when we think about that, um, when we think about the digestion that can occur within the small intestine, I'm just going to go to the next slide here. Um, the digest or the small intestine is capable of breaking down all of our food groups, especially with the addition of the pancreas. So we'll add this and pancreatic juices. There's also uh, small intestine sort of juices that get made gets made. Um, but what the mucus is going to do is again to protect the stomach acid, protect the digestive enzymes. Um, from harming the small intestine. So this is going to be very rich in bicarbonate, which is an alkaline or basic type of mucus that will neutralize the acid. And then there are different types of enzymes. A disaccharidase is going to break down our sugars. A peptidase will break down proteins. We have nucleases that break down nucleic acids like DNA. We also have lipases, which break down lipids or fats. And this is important because once that chyme from the stomach enters into the small intestine, it probably still needs to be further broken down. At this point, we've looked at many of the structures in the elementary canal. If I go back to the first slide, um, we are just about here, okay, from the mouth to the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, small intestine, but we still have a couple of areas to go. And so if we go back to our small intestine and then to the liver, the liver is not part of the alimentary canal, but rather is an accessory organ that helps to facilitate digestion. And there are two major lobes to it and a couple of ducts. Um, and there's a lot of different functions to the liver. It's also pretty large, um, kind of on the right side of the body. So different functions of the liver. First and foremost, the major digestive function is to produce bile. And what bile does is help to emulsify fats. And what emulsify means is basically um, taking lipid or fat droplets and breaking them down into smaller droplets or pieces that would be more readily digestible by the body. There's also some storage components of the liver. It's going to store fats. It's going to store different vitamins. It also stores glycogen, which is basically how our glucose gets stored in the body. Um, then it can interconvert between glucose and glycogen if necessary. Um, the liver is a major area of detoxification. Um, if you recall, one of our cellular organelles, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, is a big functioner in detox. And so our liver cells, which are called hepatocytes, have a lot of smooth ER. The liver also has some functioning in phagocytosis, and so it can kind of take care of maybe dying red blood cells, white blood cells, maybe some bacteria. And then finally, there's some synthesis or some production that takes place of different types of, of proteins. So the liver does have a lot of important functions. The only true digestive function is the production of bile. And again, that's going to help to break down our fats. Just a quick picture here. When there is liver dysfunction, um, this can cause some of the, one of the pigments called bilirubins, excuse me, to become also sort of out of whack, if you will, and this can cause jaundice. So the yellowing of the skin or the eyes is referred to as jaundice, and this could be an indication of, of some issues with the liver. Next we have the gallbladder, and the gallbladder actually sits kind of behind the liver. So if we look at this picture here, back of the liver, here's the gallbladder kind of tucked up behind it. And the gallbladder has a very, it's very small, but it packs a lot of punch. Um, basically what happens is once the liver produces bile, the gallbladder will store it, okay? So if we make a note of that, the liver produces bile, 
and the gallbladder stores the bile. This is, this is important. Um, it's going to store it and concentrate it, and then when it's needed, it will empty it into the small intestine. And then it can emulsify fats, as we looked at on the previous slide. When sometimes the bile will form salts, and these are called gallstones, and gallstones can cause a lot of pain because they're basically like little rocks in the gallbladder and then every time that gallbladder contracts it's contracting against something that's sharp and that's going to cause pain. Um, sometimes having high cholesterol in the diet can contribute to gallstones. Different types of dieting where there's a very rapid and very large amount of weight loss that can also produce gallstones. So sometimes the gallbladder has to be removed, which is fine. You can function just fine without a gallbladder, but would probably have to watch your fat um, and cholesterol intake. <clears throat> the last and also quite important um, accessory organ is the pancreas, and the pancreas also will kind of feed into the duodenum. So this picture here, what's not shown is the liver, which would be kind of right where I'm circling, but the gallbladder produces bile, or excuse me, uh, releases bile into the small intestine. And then the pancreas, which is this long, slender, knife-like organ, also can release its contents into the uh, duodenum. And so the pancreas itself has both a hormonal or endocrine function, and it also has a digestive function or an exocrine function. When we talk about endocrine versus exocrine, endocrine refers to the fact that it is the contents are released into the bloodstream, and exocrine refers to the fact that basically it's released to the outside of the cells, which I guess you can't see there. So what this means is that being a digestive or exocrine gland, the pancreas will produce juice, pancreatic juice, that produces enzymes capable of breaking down our carbohydrates, our fats, our proteins, and our nucleic acids. So all four of our macromolecules can be broken down due to our pancreas. In addition though, the endocrine function is that the pancreas also produces insulin and glucagon, and these are very important hormones in the regulation of our blood sugar, and we'll talk about that more in the endocrine unit. <clears throat> the last of the major organs in our stop on the alimentary canal, again if we go back up to our original uh, slide here, is the large intestine and then out through the anus. And so if we look at the large intestine here, there are a number of regions. Um, where the small intestine comes in, to the large intestine is called the ileocecal junction or the ileocecal valve and basically that's between the ileum and then the cecum. The cecum is this first kind of pouch within the uh, large intestine here. And so from the cecum the food is going to, or the, what's left of the food, it's pretty much feces at this point, it's going to turn right and go up the ascending colon then go across the transverse colon and down the descending colon until it gets to this S-shaped part called the sigmoid colon and then out through the rectum and the anus. The major job of the large intestine is basically to take that chyme from the small intestine and convert it into our feces. Okay, so chyme into our, into our feces. <clears throat> There's a little bit of absorption here, but only really in terms of water. So there's water absorption that occurs just enough. It, there, we leave just enough water in the feces for ease of passage. Um, in order to move through the large intestine, this is going to take almost a day, so it takes a while for that. And our feces itself are going to contain a lot of bacteria in addition to the undigested portions of our food. And again, just enough water to pass through there. Um, if we go to this next slide, this basically just reviews again the different um, parts of the large intestine and the 
and the order. So it's going to go from the ascending to transverse to descending to sigmoid. And then the rectum and anus form kind of the straight portion at the end. So the rectum is this straight muscular tube, and then the anal canal is just inferior to that where the feces will exit the body. And there are sphincters there as well to control the movement. There's an internal sphincter comprised of smooth muscle that will essentially alert the brain, alert the body, hey, I gotta go. And then when it's convenient to go, we have an external anal sphincter, which is skeletal muscle, so this is voluntary, and that when it's convenient we can expel feces from the body. Sometimes different characteristics can lead to hemorrhoids, where basically the veins within the anus are enlarged and inflamed. Um, sometimes obesity or pregnancy can do this. Um, if there's excess constipation, um, that can also lead to things like hemorrhoids. <clears throat> to help with this, there's also, in addition to water in our feces, there's different types of secretions. So mucus is important. Um, the mucus production is regulated by the parasympathetic division of our nervous system. If, if you recall, that's kind of our resting and digesting phase. And what this is going to do is basically help to lubricate the feces for ease of passage. And there's also different electrolyte pumps. Um, so, for example, if somebody has diarrhea, it can be very harmful because you're losing that water. You're losing those electrolytes and you're not absorbing them. And so it's important that within the small intestine there's water and electrolytes absorbed back into the body um, and that you're not losing that outside the body. There's also a lot of bacteria within the feces and they will produce gas as a byproduct, but they also produce vitamin K, which is which is a, a great benefit to the body for the bacteria to produce that. <clears throat> In terms of movement through the large intestine, again, it's going to take 18 to 24 hours, but we have different types of, of movements. One is called a mass movement, which is common after eating a meal. And so what happens here is that you eat a meal, but then you need to essentially make room for it um, after the fact. And so these mass movements will move feces from one area of the large intestine to another. There's also local reflexes that can contribute to the movement. So basically, if there's food in the stomach or food in the duodenum upstream, that's also going to make room in the large intestine. And um, then the defecation reflex is once the feces have gotten down to the rectum or the rectal wall, it's going to kind of push and distend the rectal wall, and that will cause the reflex and then basically will allow us to defecate when, when appropriate. This picture kind of illustrates that these different reflexes where if there's food in the stomach, if there's chyme in the duodenum, these stimulate a mass movement through the large intestine. And then again, once that feces arrives at the rectum, it pushes on the wall, and then that will initiate the defecation reflex. Lastly, as we age, some things to look forward to. Things are going to slow down. We're going to see an overall decrease in the mucus production um, in different types of connective tissue, different muscular contractions, so some of the response time, some of the ability to digest food appropriately might change. And then we're also more susceptible to infection, to toxins, um, cancers, ulcers. Um, ulcers, again, are basically the fact that a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori will eat away at the mucus lining of the stomach and then expose the wall to that hydrochloric acid, which can be very dangerous.